Welcome to the Motoring Podcast, your weekly discussion of motoring news. This is episode 528 on Tuesday, the 6th of June, 2023. Hello, I'm Alan. Hello, I'm Andrew. And in a week where many who repeated factually inaccurate information got very angry at someone repeating factually inaccurate information, will be charged up by your creativity. New new car news sparks our interest to varying degrees. And the lunchtime read takes us to another time and place for something utterly glorious. But first, we have to get back to an old friend we haven't seen for a little while, Dieselgate follow-up. And this is the news that Volkswagen and Audi have agreed, in principle, to pay $85 million to the state of Texas because of the environmental laws they broke thanks to Dieselgate. Now, this is the latest state to have got this civil case sorted. There is Ohio which only settled for 3.5 million. Or settled for only, yeah. <laughs> yes, at one point that Volkswagen said was going to be 127 billion per year. <laughs> yeah, so people I think are starting to get to the stage of, look, we're just going to settle this and get, get some money or nothing, or this could drag on for years and years and years. But that's, that's the problem when they lost the case where they were trying to say that Clean Air Act only meant that the US government could uh, sue them. Hmm. And that was thrown out of court. So now every state is just going, give us our pound of flesh, please. I can't remember. I've got a feeling we're up to about 35 billion in what this has cost VW, let alone, you know, the R&D and everything for going to completely EV. I'm just talking about fines and stuff. Yeah. The hefty thing this is still costing Volkswagen. It is. The trouble is we're looking at that and going, only 3.5 million, mm, <laughs> or yeah. only 85 million. And we think, oh, we've got off lightly there. Yeah, That gives you just the scale of the scale of it really is just, it, it's too big for us mere mortals to comprehend these numbers. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, do you want to take us to another bit of follow-up though? Oh, I'll tell a bit of follow-up. Obviously somebody said last week in a YouTube-esque um, attempt to to drive interaction on the social media channels. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Yo, guys. You hate you guys. Yeah, so a couple of... Uh, a couple of suggestions for electric gritter names. Thanks, Nia. Um, the de-icer. Awesome. Yeah, a salt water. Uh, what, oh, what, I've just got it. Yeah, what? Has it, uh, and uh, also dual tide grittings. Thank you, Nia, for putting a tiny percentage of your massive brain onto such a ridiculous, ridiculous thing. I thank you immensely. I thought it was brilliant and brought a nice little bit of cheer and a smile to my face. So for that alone, it must be worth it. I looked at it and went, oh, for goodness sake. Brilliant. That was actually what I did. All right, take us to the new news and it's the start of the month. Start of the month. So new car registration figures for the UK for May uh, 2023 are in. In total, year-on-year -year increase of 16.7%, uh, uh, with a total of 145,204 new cars being registered. That is a little bit below 2021, but the last time it was at this kind of level, you're looking at about 2009, 2010. Yep. Said still an improvement. It's down on 2021, but 2021, everything was just unlocking. There was a massive backlog of vehicles sitting at dealerships uh, ready to hit the roads. Not quite sure where the delay is. Is there are there fewer people wishing to purchase be purchase vehicles now, or is it supply and demand? I think supply and demand has lessened a bit. Yeah, fleet is up um, for May. It's up year on year, nearly thirty seven percent, and mm -hmm. for the year to date, it's up nearly thirty nine percent. Whereas private is it's a rounding error of no increase at all. Really, it's it's minus yeah point five of a percent for May and minus. 0.9 of a percent for overall. Like you say, I don't know whether that's a reflection of people's confidence in the economic situation of the country or whether it is, well, we got our cars previously, mm. so we're not really looking. Yeah. I saw uh, one little piece of analysis saying that people are buying cars because they need to buy cars as opposed to anything else. Mm. It's not a sort of, hey, let's go out and buy something fun for the sake of it just quickly it's worth mentioning diesel now 7.6 percent market share these are combined uh diesel and mild hybrid similarly petrol and mild hybrid petrol eighty two thousand eight hundred uh from the total uh, and nice round number uh, but 57 percent of the market share 
in other ones, battery electric vehicles. Uh, so they're now 16.9% of the of, of the market is, is battery electric vehicles. Yeah. Uh, plug-in hybrids are taking 6.2% now. Let's hit the top 10, and it's all change in the top... Well, not really all change. A reshuffle. And there is a reshuffle. But first of all, uh, I invite you all to take a drink, because at number 10 is the Toyota Yaris 2484 units registered. Uh, that is just behind the Tesla Model Y. Then at number eight, the Nissan Juke, uh, 2,534. So there's really not a lot in it between eight and 10. Uh, seven is the Volvo XC40. Six is the Hyundai Tucson. Fifth is the Audi A3. The Audi A3 breaking the 3,000 miles of 3,018 registered there. Number four, the Vauxhall Corsa, 3,028. Uh, number three, the Vauxhall Mocha. Just ahead of it there with 3,066. Number two, the Nissan Qashqai, 3,140. And number one, the Ford Puma with 4,184. Basically, every there are so many models out there these days that mm. the numbers are so low for these that really between two and 10, there's barely 600 units. Mm. I think there's slightly less than 600 units. And then a 1,000 unit jump from the Qashqai to the Puma. What that means in the year to date, uh, is that the Puma has now jumped ahead of the Corsa and is now uh, the most registered new vehicle in the U- new car in the UK it, thus far in 2023. It goes Puma, Corsa, Casco, Duke, Tucson, Sportage, Model Y, Fiesta, Mini, and Turok. Mm-hmm. I'll take us to the spreadsheet of Doom, which is not as doomy. It's not very doomy, is it? As ever, I will go with the negatives. And our bath is down 89%, Bentley down 42%. Oh, just to put that in context, last year they registered 187, this year 109. When you look at the cost per vehicle, that's a massive amount of revenue, though. Hmm. Citroen is down 19%, DS is down 32%, Fiat is down 35%, Honda down 18%, Jeep down a round figure of 59%. Then we get to Mercedes-Benz down 25%. Smart is also down, and they're down 88%. Alan, cheer us up, please. Well, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty decent for anyone who isn't Stellantis, isn't it? Sorry, I'm just scrolling mm, through that. I think you're right, yeah. Peugeot are up 2.2%, but that's it in the Stellantis brands. Anyway, uh, everyone else is doing not badly. Uh, there are a couple of, couple of big big jumps there so uh alpine up 105 percent. so the 35 vehicles audi up 30 percent. cooper up 96 percent. genesis up 167 percent. jaguar 22 percent. Woo! yes finally something positive about jaguar. i know exactly yes lexus up 131 maserati 27 mazda 84 mg 100 nissan 56 Polestar at 141, Porsche 32, Renault 41, Skoda 52. This is doing well for the Volkswagen brand. Mm. Sangyong 28, Subaru 123, Suzuki 31. Tesla win the MG award for going from 25 vehicles registered, because remember this was the silly where it was really up and down last year, yeah. uh, to 3,439. That's up 13,656%. Well, that's got to be our, our biggest that increase. Has one, definitely one of the biggest. Toyota up 16, Volvo up 77, and other British up a 45.75. Uh, congratulations and welcome to INEOS who have mm. made the list, who are now on the list, and who registered 182 vehicles. That's quite a press fleet. I think there concludeth the spreadsheet of doom. Yes. We've got a couple of JLR stories. Let's start with the one that involves cars, shall we? <laughs> okay. Shaggy <laughs> Land Rover is recalling I-Pace vehicles in the US over... Uh, Fire risks connected to the battery pack, but they are not sure yet whether it's the assembly is defective or whether there are conditions that mean something happens that causes the fire. Mm-hmm. So they've decided to recall nearly 6,400 to make sure that uh, nobody is accidentally exposed to any risk. Mm-hmm. What I'm not sure is why it's only in the US, unless they use a different battery, a different construction, 
or a different set of software to regulate it? Well, it may be. Now, there is a chance that a lot, that there are many of these over here are used by Google and stuff for autonomous stuff. Mm -hmm. And so it may be that there, there's something related to that sort of usage or just where it is, or it may be that there's a different charging unit in yeah. it to a company because it's a it'll be a they do a lot of dc in the us don't they yeah so it may well be a different a different actual charging port mm. uh, and can and charge kind of control module i know that that's probably not the right thing i'm sorry so it's quite likely it could be something like that that's that's the difference i bet we've got a listener that knows i bet, I I bet, bet we've, we've got a listener got if, if, if somebody does knows. know the reason i mean i'm genuinely interested in why it's market specific if you do happen to know, do please get in touch with the show. Yeah, it, my bet is it's possibly something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see all that. Uh, if it, if they are keeping it US specific, but again, there's an issue, so there's a recall. This is a good thing. Mm. Uh, you know, that's six thousand four hundred being recalled just in the US alone over eight yeah. maximum of eight. This is well, you know, well done, good stuff, etc. Keeping us safe. They didn't have to have their arm twisted either, or publicly shamed. Exactly, exactly. That's kind of why I'm kind of why I'm saying it. Recalls are generally a good thing. Yep. Okay. Do you want to take us to the non-car related no, JLR stuff? Not really, Alan? because some of it really doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> oh, it does. It's very no, important. It doesn't. It doesn't. So there's been lots of words said and written and reported on. So it's very important. That's the only reason we're covering it. JLR has revealed a new logo for the group. What's the first time the group's had a logo? It is the first time the group's had a logo since British Leyland. And it's better. No, uh, okay. Some may say it's better than that. Um, it is a J, an L, and an R. The J and the L alone, if they were in a square, would look a lot like a British department store group. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a very similar font uh, with an R on the end. That's it. That's lovely. And it's people are going, well, it's not nice. And it's, it's not graphically, it's not beautifully balanced fundamentally should we give a flying flip no we shouldn't this is something it's like to put stellantis's, stellantis's logo. logo could yeah. you describe stellantis's logo to to do you no there's just the word stellantis in capitals and dots, spaced out I and think. some things yeah yeah and I, so i don't care this is for going on stationary this is not for going on cars yeah yeah if you're still having a paddy about that just give over more to the point uh, their shift they're also and again, this is like the last time. This is a lot of stuff. I don't know why they're bothering to tell us most of this. And it ending up in the mainstream automotive press. Because frankly, in the past, nobody would have given two hoots. It would have got a paragraph or two in auto car and in motor, and that would have been that. Well, is it possibly to do with the ham-fisted way it was announced a few weeks ago? I think it's quite There's a lot. There's now of a lot of that. clarification going on. There's also new senior management who have to be shown that they're doing things. Yes. Proactive. These are the things Proactive. that they're doing. Yes. JLR is moving to an agency model to bring a warmer, more relaxed dealer experience. They're doing all sorts of fun things like replacing the counters with coffee bars, which will doubtless be mostly devoid of coffee in nine months' time, and have someone standing behind it and using it as a reception desk because people come in and they're confused about where they're meant to go, but there's this coffee here. But who do they actually go and speak to? Well, they're all going to be, they, they can speak to anyone who's customer facing because they're all going to look lovely. Are you going into this one? Part of this is that there's a new lookbook for the brand. So get get this one. This one gives, gave me a good chuckle, actually. It says what the, the under this new house of brands strategy, where I'm surprised everyone doesn't have to carry a handbag. The house of brands strategy, uh, they've said what staff should wear, which is fine. That's normal. Uh, what does make me chuckle here is that it's there to combine very dark blue suits with white leather trainers and white t shirts or black roll neck jumpers, which sounds a lot like. Someone I can think of in Jaguar. Mm, someone, someone who to likes to wield a pen. Yes, which is kind of funny. There's all sorts of knock-on effects of that, though, of course, because it's unbranded. The way they're doing it, it is, it is unbranded, and it'll just be, you know, look for the guys in the suits and trains. I do, the, my worry is, right, and this is terribly stereotypical, is that whenever you get sort of maybe someone who's been in the... Or, I mean, it looks great whenever you whenever you sort of go to one of these model agencies and you hire in or your motor show staff. Mm. 
and all your PR and your PR and your PR launch support staff on launches, which you all you all have to have a sort of certain look. Then this is this is great. Mm. The trouble is, if you've been in the industry for quite a long time, perhaps, and you're a little bit older, there is that chance you look one step away from Rabsy Nesbit. <laughs> you know, um, with uh, with the yeah with the trainers in the dark suit and. Well, maybe not uh, a string vest, but you, you can see where I'm going. Anyway, it's unbranded. The challenge with unbranded is unless the dealers are rather smart about this, either people go out by their own, at which point they're probably a little narked that they have to change and buy their own stuff mm. when it's being prescribed to them. Uh, because the challenge is that if the dealership just supplies stuff, it just says, okay, here's money to, to do it, then it's a taxable benefit. Because it's not branded, it's not safety safety wear. Yeah. It's not it's it's not it's not corporate clothing. I did notice that Chris Clark from John Clark Motor Group, uh, which in this article from Auto Retail says uh they've got a problem the issues with the benefit in kind by working with corporate workwear provider that knows the rules and knows how to work with them, uh, and he recommends other retailers do the same thing. I think retails are a little bit knocked by by that sort of stuff. Yeah, there's one example in here where they've got 26 customer facing staff. If they go via the recommended, because there's there's obviously uh, JLR in there, um, House of Brands and the Lookbook recommend a particular supplier, that, but they make it clear you don't have to use them. But the, the if you go they with the make, recommended, it's clear. about a thousand pound per person to be kitted out. So if you've got 26 people. That's suddenly quite a dent in your money. At the same time as you're having to rebuild and restructure your your actual premises to match the new stuff from this lookbook. And it's gone to an agency model. Yeah. There's lots of ways this could have been handled perhaps better. There is one other thing I need to question, and that's they built that brand new service centre and everything in the West End of London. Oh, yeah. Do you remember? It was the giant months one. Ago, the giant, giant one. Yeah. Wonder which look it follows. Out of, I'm curious. I'm genuinely curious because, of course, I'm nowhere near it. So it's very difficult for me to get to it. I'm sure it was, It had the old Land Rover yeah, so and I'm sure. Jaguar um, logos on the side. Well, they would have to because they could unveil the new ones. Yeah. But I can't remember if it was if it's this new look right through and they have to redo the new plan. No, anyway, best to not to that. think about it. SEP. Someone else's problem. Yes. Yes. Uh, so in the show notes, there's going to be a, a few links to articles for you to read through if you would like to know more about the rebranding, more about where JLR... I don't know why you would. I mean, I've just sickened myself on it. Think that uh, the exciting opportunities uh, and other other phrases in uh, inverted commas that are liberally spread out amongst all these articles <laughs> for things like the Discovery brand, et cetera, et cetera, you can click on them to read more. Yes, uh, the one thing I was going to say about Discovery Brand, uh, Landro Discovery has huge potential in its own brand. Worth remembering just very, very quickly that in North America, they actually discontinued the Discovery Brand for two generations for the Disco 3 and Disco 4, which was sold over here as the LR3 and the LR4, because the first two generations of Discovery got such a reputation that they decided not to use it in future. Yes, there is huge potential, but remember that in certain parts of the world, it does also carry quite a lot of, of, of luggage with it. Well, on that front, I did see a quote from a senior management, and I, I can't remember who, who it was who specifically said it, but they directly referred to they have to sort out their reliability. Mm -hmm. Oh, awesome. It's being acknowledged. They've acknowledged it previously, but it's being acknowledged at senior level when the question is asked of them, that's which I, I bet they knew was coming and they didn't want to have to field. No. But that's the one thing that really is letting both the brands down repeatedly i feel that we sit here and i feel that we we, we give them uh, that's one of the reasons i've tried to race through that relatively quickly is we feel i feel that we give them an un unnecessary kicking sometimes from a position of i really want this to su to succeed i really yeah. wish they'd stop doing things which stop it but i do sometimes feel, even hear ourselves and think oh okay here we go again mm -hmm. and, and i want it to be I please get it right get please it right, fix it basically and it's other it's, companies can Anyway, let's move on. I'll take us to Milton Keynes now. And this is the news that a car rental service is going to use a remotely driven 
system to take vehicles and people around Milton Keynes after being tested for 18 months and a whole 1,000 miles. There will be a safety driver in the driver's seat ready to take over in case anything goes wrong. Uh, and the remote operator, who is basically sitting in a sim rig, if uh, you look at the picture, with a few screens <laughs> and a map that is doing the remote driving. Mm -hmm. This is all within a four-mile radius of Milton Keynes city centre. <sighs> and then once the person has been dropped off, they've got the vehicle back to base. It's quite strange. I still don't completely get it, but it's... Um... Well, it's it's insane. I guess it's only because you've got someone sitting. You've only got someone sitting there who does there just in case. Uh, there is a quote here from uh, an an RAC spokesman, uh, and they were saying that they're concerned that remote driving of vehicle distances the driver from the potential road safety consequences in a video game like manner. That's not the that's not the real problem with it. There's a host of problems with telling there, there are there I are. Mean, that's just one of them. Well, the first well the first problem is can it connect and stay connected well, without any lag. Well, of course there's lag. Even if there was a cable running from there, there is lag of some shape or form over the person sat in the seat. Whether they react in the same time, is it doesn't matter, but there will be a lag of information. Hmm. Also, there's sensory deprivation. Yeah, I was getting on to this, but yeah. Which, uh, there's going to be a link in the show notes to a Medium article from Michael Decourt. He's written a, a really good article that explains all the problems to do with teleoperational. Uh, and similar to last week, it is insane that the regulator is allowing this in any way. It is insane that there is a company out there thinking that this is a suitable way to do things. And I don't care whether you're on the public road or whether you're in a dockyard. It is nuts to do this for a whole host of reasons, which will endanger the vehicles and the people around yes. it. Yes, it is not, not great. So do have a quick look at the BBC article. Uh, have a read of Michael Decourt's article. His article is from 7th of February 2019, but it's still relevant. Uh, that doesn't change its, its relevance. Okay, Alan, do you want to take us to something new? Yes, something old, something new. Nothing seems to be particularly borrowed and th there is no blue. But Porsche have just spent three years doing all the background work to updating their badge and their logo. And they seem to have chosen the very Porsche uh, approach and a very valid approach of don't change it. <laughs> and so this has been getting quite a lot of chuckles around the internet. What they've done is that they've sort of looked at it, they've, they've sort of changed the texturing more than they've changed anything else, I think, mm. uh, and made the, the word Stuttgart above the rearing horse. Yes. <laughs> Good use of words there. They've actually well destylized the horse slightly so it is a little more realistic and, and sort of tidied it up. I think they have modified it and brought it up to date in a very nice and sympathetic manner, much as they are famed for doing with the 911. I think this is the first good looking logo update that can be digital. Yes. One of the, the for me, the thing I really like about it is that it hasn't been flattened. They haven't gone. I mean, it, it is less textured, less fussily textured than it was before. And I think it's, and I really like it because it's because of that. Mm. And because it isn't just like another sticker. Because I feel a lot of ones we've seen over the last couple of years, it's basically as if someone's gone, got the logo, gone, posterize, and, and that's kind of it. Yeah. To make this vector art. Yeah, basically. I mean, this could be vector, I suppose, now. Uh, but this is only the one, two, three, four, five, sixth generation of the Porsche badge. All of them, you can, put, can compare the original to this one, and you go, oh, yeah, that's a Porsche badge. Mm. Because it is. Again, they don't update these things very often. It's got to last for quite a while, so there's no point in going through and, and being radical in a way that, as fashions change in five years, they have to update it again, like so many brands do. Yeah. So to be honest, because Porsche have such a slow evolution of these things, three years, it's not a big deal. First of all, go out, find out what works, find out what people like, find out what thing. Honestly, it's not that ridiculous a time scale. And I actually think that the outcome was probably worth it. 
says the person who, whose degree was what, and therefore will justify anyone wielding a crayon for however long Product it takes. Product design engineering, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. Right, I'm going to take us from Germany to Scotland, though. Uh, and there is news from Scotland's uh, transport ministry that they are going to upgrade the A83. Rest and be thankful in Argyll, where they're going to stick a tunnel over a portion of the road, 1.4 kilometres long, I think it is, because it is so susceptible to landslip and blockage from uh, debris, rocks, that sort of thing, that it, it shuts the roads for huge amounts of time over a year. Just for example, in 2020, it was shut for 200 days. And if you need to get around that, and the there is a sort of road that is below it that can be used, but if that gets blocked as well, it's a 53-mile reroute, hmm. which is quite a bit out of the way, but that happens to be a lot of what Scotland is. Yes. <laughs> Well, there aren't really many roads in that part of Scotland. No, no, you need to tarmac the place more. That's what you need to do. Yeah, that's definitely what that's definitely what the west the west coast and the West Highlands need. Yeah, <laughs> this is good. This has been a problem for a long, long time, and I I definitely think that if people live out towards Inverary, then you won't find yeah you, know, you won't find much in the way of uh, much in the way of opposition uh, yeah. because this is this is quite serious. If you want to go see exhibitions of the new tunnel plan, uh, it will be held uh, for four days from the 12th of June in Aracha and Loch Gilphead, which is a long way, but it's a lovely drive. <laughs> it's apparently going to cost, uh, as it's stated here now, and we'll see how much that changes by the time it's finished, between 405 and £470 million. Mm. Uh, there is no indication of how long it's going to take to build, but I would imagine that's going to be probably four or five years. I would imagine so. People are going to be pretty much on it, though, um, because yes. it is it is quite an important link. Yeah. Also, one side of it is going to be open, um, so you you won't have the the views ruined. You'll still get to see the beautiful landscape. It's not a it's not a tunnel really. It's more a sort of roofed pergola. <laughs> they do the similar things in the Alps. This is not. A, yes, it's that's, not that's a, it's what it not, reminded me of. It's not a, a it's not a unique solution to this kind of problem. No. do do it quite a lot in Switzerland, Italy, and France. Yeah. Anyway, that brings us to a guilt minute, the quick break in the show where we ask for a tad of financial support, keep the lights on and the hosting running. If you feel that motoring podcasts worth a small consideration every month, then you can become a patron. Different levels of patron include different levels of commitment from us to you, including being able to watch the show recorded live. We also have a small range of merchandise in our spring store from stickers to mugs and t-shirts. If you don't have any spare cash, and we do completely understand, then you can help us by following for free from a podcast player to receive every show as they're released and by liking and rating the show in whatever way your podcast supplier lets you. If you've done all of that, and some of you do, so thank you very much, then the last thing you can do is to recommend us to your friends or colleagues. Thank you, everyone that does. Hmm. New New Car News, Alan. Can you take us to an actual electric car? Please? Yes, believe it or not. The new forthcoming Astra Electric, uh, which will be priced in hatch form from £39,995, uh, will get 258 miles of range and fast charge in 26 minutes, according to Car Magazine. Uh, and it, it's a car. It is very much a car. It is not an SUV type thing. It's not a stretched thing where people have gone, oh, yeah, don't not... call it an SUV because <laughs> it's not, and it really is an SUV. Yeah, yeah. It, no, it is, it is an Astra in hatch and estate forms. Yep. Yeah, 54 kilowatt. Uh, battery, 154 brake horsepower, 062, 9.26, top speed of 100, 106 miles an hour. And it looks really good. Yes. Yeah, I mean, Vauxhall's aesthetics, is, I think, is, is one of the nicest in the Stellantis group at the moment. I've said that the Vauxhall's biggest problem is that Vauxhall's, Vauxhall's called Vauxhall. Mm. I also like the fact that the 0 to 62 is 9.2 seconds rather than you know, about five seconds or something, they have clearly gone for, well, let's make the range go longer because 9.2 seconds is more than quick enough, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. especially with the immediate torque. Mm -hmm. Its competition will be the electric Peugeot 308 hatch and SW uh, estate version. Mm. It's good. It looks nice. Like it. Yeah. What about a new Lexus, though? Yeah, Lexus announced yesterday. They are going to bring out a small SUV called the LBX, 
And then this is based on, but isn't a rebadging, but this is based on the platform that the Yaris Cross uses. However, they do they have stretched it to better fit the market that Lexus are in, because Lexus have made this very clear. They're not making a cheap car, they are making a small Lexus. And with that means it needs to do certain Lexus things, <laughs> as in feel like a Lexus, drive like a Lexus, and if someone bought it, you know, you get the Lexus experience from it. Mm. Whew, that's enough Lexus in one. That's in a one quite a paragraph. lot of Lexus. Uh, the, the comment that, that the old CT hatchback, which by the way didn't look or feel like a Lexus, was six inches longer and four inches wider. So this is quite small. This is the smallest new Lexus that there's been ever. I think. Yeah. Oh uh, so, no 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 no. Uh, yes, because they never made a Lexus version of the IQ, did they? Pardon me. No no they didn't. So it's going to be a 1.3 litre uh, three-cylinder petrol engine that's going to be mated to a single electric motor at a uh, time of the first models coming out that will get about 134 brake horsepower through the front wheels. They expect a 0-62, to 62, again, of 9.2 seconds. Again, that's a sensible speed. Uh, with the CO2 emissions, it's quoted here as comfortably below 120 grams per kilometre. So, If it's anything like the Yaris Cross, it will run on air and magic <laughs> with occasional sips of petrol. It's- well, th- this is actually an article that's worth clicking through on because Lexus do explain how they had some challenges getting to the point where they are revealing this because of the constraints of the size of the model and their brand and what it needs to do. So that it's, it's actually, from that point of view, it's interesting. Aesthetically, mm. Um, they've toned down the predator mouth now, which, uh, seems to be a thing that they are doing across the bra- uh, across the brand. Um, it's, it's a small SUV. Uh, it looks pretty nice. I like, I like the red that it, the photographs are in. Yes, it um, is. It's nice, isn't it? We'll wait to see though, if it is the, it has the driving dynamics that it's talked about in this article. I just, I just love the idea of Lexus driving dynamics and I drive a Lexus GX and <laughs> Well, it talks about here minimising body pitch and roll and the heavy load. <laughs> oh, we'll need to record a special edition, won't we? Yes. yes, we uh, yes. <laughs> anyway, talking of SUVs, do you want to take us to possibly towards the other end of the scale on these? Speaking of V8 SUVs, uh, the new Range Rover Sport SV is a mild hybrid super SUV that's getting 626 brake horsepower. Yes, the most powerful production Range Rover will introduce game-changing tech and will be sold by invitation only. There we go, yes. Only two and a half ton. Yeah, two and a half tons. I'm trying to see if there's a price on here in this auto 4.4 litre V8. Is that all? And um, yes, but you can get it with optional carbon fibre wheels, saving 36 kilograms. Carbon ceramic brakes, saving another 34 kilograms. Oh, I I really want this to go to 0-62 to in 3.6 seconds. And it will go all the way up to 180 mile an hour. My word, to punch that thing through the air up to 180 mile an hour, that's the engine is wow. I mean, that's top engineering. Active anti roll system. To do I mean, that. It, it really is no difference from my Lexus, is it? The, I think that this is both incredible and ridiculous. And ridiculous at the same time. I mean, I am absolute admiration for this working and existing. Yes. At the same time, I really don't want one. Well, as as it's by invitation, mm. JLR will be able to easily map how quickly someone puts it over a roundabout, as they seem to yeah. do round our way with a Range Rover Sport. Predict within the first fortnight. Uh, edition one cars will cost me around one hundred and sixty nine thousand or one hundred and ninety thousand. With the carbon fiber options specified, first customer deliveries will be before the end of this year. As I say, I am in awe of it in a sort of slightly wow kind I, of I way. I love the engineering and it does feat look, that's gone it through. It does look good. It looks good as well. Quite yeah. Nice. Anyway, right. Other end of the scale, Andrew. Okay. Winding it back to perhaps something a bit more, bit more grassroots, uh, and that's the Caterham's EV7. And this isn't a vehicle that, as is described here, going to come out to market. It is a proof of concept. And what they have done is 
They have worked together with Swindon Powertrain to develop a unique powertrain solution, as it says in this Evo article. And as it's EV, people are expecting it to be way heavier. It's not. It's only 70 kilograms heavier. So that's, that's a passenger. But it's not just that. It's 70 kilos heavier, and it's all down low and in the middle. So it makes way less difference than really 70 kilos, you know, than, than if it was a passenger, their weight would all be over to one side, all be up high. It's a 51 kilowatt um, battery, 40 kilowatt usable, it says pack. And it's using very clever immersion cooling, which means that the fluid is always in contact with the battery pack. So it is maximizing the efficiency of the cooling and maximizing everything out of the battery pack, which is, which is the sort of thing these small bespoke manufacturers will do to for the technology is because they have very unique uh, needs that the more mainstream OEMs are not worried about mm-hmm. because they're worried about getting vehicles out the other end. And this can then be adopted. Mm. You've got to remember, of course, in the UK, it's great motorsport heritage. I mean, and, I mean, there are lots of small specialist shops with lots of skill. In any mm. of these areas, from crafting flipping wooden body shells to designing bespoke battery packs and charging yeah. setups, uh, we've got all of those skills in the UK, and and it's great to see those being maximised. And you can bet the same people who did this will do stuff in high end motorsport as well, because we're yeah. just darn good at it. So it's great to see it being used in a hopefully at some point, customer-facing type vehicle. Yeah. What they've also done is that they have gone for a track drive cycle. So that what they mean from that is it'll do 20 minutes flat out on the track, charge for 15 minutes because it can use up to 152 kilowatt peak DC charging, mm-hmm. and then you can immediately go out and do another 20 minutes. Mm-hmm. So you've got, you've got this race around, stop briefly, race around again, stop briefly. And... and- the great things I was saying to Andrew earlier on is is that many Catrims live, you know, between the weekends, uh, they live in a garage uh, linked up to a battery tender. And to be honest, this is going to be no different in real life. Mm. A slow trickle charger will just just sit there and it'll be be charged and ready. Anyway, next up, uh, Volkswagen. There's so much stuff this week. Sorry, Volkswagen has shown a new long wheelbase ID Buzz with seven seats. A three possible 355 brake horsepower GTX variant eventually, and yes, a third row of seats. Uh, reception has been, I think it's fair to say, mixed. I think people go, We like the looks, but we don't like the lack of actual real life practicality. I think it mm. still myths people that you can't fit three kitty seats across that middle row. In either version, uh, I think people are a bit disappointed that there's no space behind that final row of seats. And one of the comments I've seen is, it looks great. It's just such a shame. Volkswagen have managed to create an electric vehicle which is less practical than its internal combustion engine counterpart. And that's it for me as well. That, that's where I get with this. I get so frustrated with it because it, it should be right up my street. It should be me going, that's it, that's what I want. Absolutely brilliant. I love the look of it. I mean, to be fair, we were teased with this look for what, a decade or so. I think it was 21 years. <laughs> there was a, an article, I think it was on the Autopian. Okay. So on the drive or the Autopian, and it was saying, you know, it's been 21 years before we've been able to actually buy one of these things. And the they US. bring it out, and they, they don't... <laughs> and particularly when it's a, a, a their own platform, fresh platform, they're not cobbling something together to bring mm. it out like they did with the Beetle, which was based on a golf platform. Yeah. This is their own platform. They could have easily made it much more practical and they haven't. But they'll sell loads because people like the look of them they, and everything, which is what they need to happen because they, the, they need the money to come back in so they can reinvest it into the software yeah, and the development of the battery tech and all the rest of these th- things. Th- this will be soccer moms up and down both the East Coast and the West Coast of the US. Mm. We'll be clamoring for these to to drive folk around because that sort of that that range is is pretty good. That's you know it's a good few days of, of carting everyone back and forth to school to clubs to all these kind of things. Yep, it cannot fail. I can't see how this thing can fail, but it could have been better. Yep. 
That's the thing. It's so close to being perfect. Last one, Andrew, the new Mercedes-Benz SLS. Yes, otherwise known as the MGHS, uh, has got a mild refresh where they've sharpened up the front which so it looks uh, a little bit like the uh, SLS, as Alan has alluded to. They've also improved the in-cabin tech. Um, and also one thing I noticed, which I hadn't spotted before, high beam assist is apparently part of safety tech now. I missed that memo. Oh, sorry, I've always considered that. One of the best-selling MGs who sell an awful lot of vehicles in the UK has updated their stuff to make it nicer inside and work with the latest uh, software and tech that they have in the rest of their range. Mm-hmm. The electric MGs get uh, always seem to get a really good rate up. I think we've mm-hmm. had a little bit of experience of non-ones, but those were unofficial test cars. So yeah. you can never sort of tell what their life has been. Do you want to take us to points of interest? Yes, points of interest starts off, of course, with lunchtime read. Uh, this one, this week, it's from Derivas and Ives, but it's the article is written by Paranjay Dutt, and it's about a chap's 1958 Mercedes-Benz W120 Ponton, and how just over the last 20-odd years, they've restored it and rebuilt it, and just it's just beautiful. The story that goes with it, the pictures are fantastic. The car is gorgeous, and it's just really do take the time to have a to have a read of this and and look at the pictures because it's it's just lovely, really lovely. And I now want matching luggage with all my cars, mm. preferably in red, etc., etc., etc. Yes, yes. Right, list of the week comes from Haggerty and is the ten concept cars that saw in the two thousands in style. Now, this is actually. Mostly a very hard one to pick. This is a so, really Alan. good list. Thanks, Ant. Uh, and I'm still scrolling back and forth trying to make up my mind between about four of them, but I'm going to choose uh, one of the ones I haven't seen in the flesh. The Cadillac 16 from 2003. Good choice. Good yes. Choice. But, well, it's from back when the American manufacturers were really showing some awesome concepts i mean chrysler of course were at the the peak back then of uh, chrysler were a peak concept car a uh, gm and cadillac were not far behind and this was showing off a 13.6 liter 16 cylinder engine massive luxury car obviously nothing came of it as ever i think it's lovely i mean the, the design style went through i mean i tried that cadillac elr uh mm. recently and again, you can actually see, a, 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 I've just said the design style came to absolutely nothing. Uh, and I'm about to say, and you can see the lineage between that and the, uh, between this, this, uh, the Cadillac 16 and, and that ELR, uh, just in the, the form of the grill, the headlamps, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, nothing so opulent as the concept came out. Yes, I think that's Because it just exudes way. opulence. And it is to me. Flipping classy. Yeah, lovely. Absolutely, lovely. absolutely gorgeous loved it love it a great choice the rest of the list is fantastic so do please uh click through from the show notes um and, yep. and find that one okay alan the and finally and finally this week uh <laughs> yes there's a but uh, there's a but there is there's a but uh there's this is a story from the autopian uh, mitsubishi uh, press cars uh here in the u.s uh so the press cars for the new outlander uh fev uh came with with a butt print and the idea of the the butt print was to show off just how much more supportive the seating materials were uh, and how much the pressures of your body were spread more widely across your posterior it's kind of funny it's it's really it's a nicely written little piece by thomas hundall do have a little read it's it's a good it's a good chuckle that's kind of us for this week i think uh any parish notes, Andrew? Nothing in particular. Nope. No, brilliant. Okie doke. So it's really just down to me to remind you that between now and next week, you can give us any feedback, share your thoughts to the show at Motoring Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, on Facebook, and on the contact page of motoringpodcast.com, the hub of all our activities. Uh, remember, you can support us financially via Patreon, and please leave a review and rating on Apple Podcasts or however your podcast app lets you do such a thing. Andrew, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Best way to get in touch with me is via Mastodon. If you search for Crack Windscreen, you'll find me there. And Alan, what's the best way for people to get in touch with you personally? Yes, to get in touch with me personally, uh, just as well to use Twitter or Mastodon, where I'm at AJP Bradley. That's B R A D L 
E Y. Uh, we'll be back very soon, but until then, I've been Alan Bradley. I've been Andrew Clues. And safe motoring.